My dearly beloved in Christ, today is the third of three Sundays with big names. Septuagesima, sexagesima, quinquagesima. And the purpose of these three Sundays is to serve as a transition into the season of Lent, to dispose us, to prepare well, and to enter well into the season of Lent. Quinquagesima actually means 50. Today is not exactly 50 days until Easter. It is actually seven weeks, 49 days to Easter. But Holy Mother Church rounds the number up to 50, just as we had 70, 60, and now 50. And of course, this Wednesday, we begin the season of Lent. Now, Lent, the idea of spending a period of 40 days fasting, doing penance, started way back in the fourth century. And originally, Lent began next Sunday, which is called Quadragesima, which means 40. And so that was exactly 40 days up to Good Friday. But one of the popes came along and said, well, it really isn't proper to fast on Sundays, so there will be no fasting on the Sundays. So he added the previous four days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this week, so that there would be exactly 40 days, not counting Sundays, beginning with Ash Wednesday up to and including Holy Saturday. And we fast and we do penance in imitation of our Lord, who began his public life, as we will read in next Sunday's Gospel, by going into the desert and fasting for 40 days. Now, it is understandable, nothing wrong, with someone who thinks, well, I'm going to give up this or that for Lent, so I want to enjoy it one more time before Lent begins. So let's say there's a dessert you particularly like, and you have that the day before, or th this time of the, of the year, right before Ash Wednesday, because you're going to give it up. No problem there, as long as there's always moderation. Now, Lent used to be much more rigid than what we observe. In fact, if you go back to the early Middle Ages, there was no meat at all, or fish, or eggs, or dairy products. And then gradually, fish was allowed, or dairy products and eggs, and it came down to be limiting meat, allowing it only at the main meal, unless it's a day of abstinence. But because of that rigidity, how strictly Lent was observed, there began some practices that the church did not approve because they went into excess. And that was celebrating a couple of days before Lent, especially the day before, the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, by excessive celebrations. And these came to be known by a couple of words, a couple of terms. In Italy, it was called carnival. Now, we think of carnival as a, as a celebration of rides and games and food and so forth, but it originally was the celebration in Europe of the last couple days or several days right before Lent. And again, it went into excess, excessive eating and drinking and debauchery and just indulgence, which the church condemned. But where did the word carnival come from? Two Latin words, carne vale, which means farewell to meat. Since they weren't going to be having meat, you go back again when Lent first began to be observed, they would want to eat meat right before Lent. No problem there, as long again as there's always moderation. Another name for the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday was, as you know, Mardi Gras, which comes from the French. Fat Tuesday, literally, because, again, of excessive indulgence in eating shortly before Lent. But I would like to give you a third phrase or term for the day before Ash Wednesday, which has a much more Catholic and proper meaning. And that is what the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday was called in England, in those happy days before Henry VIII, when England was Catholic, and was called Shrove Tuesday. 
Now, what on earth does shrove come from? It comes from a verb, an archaic English verb, to shrive. And to shrive means to absolve from sin, pertains to confession. So someone would go to confession and would say, I have been shriven of my sins. So it was called Shrove Tuesday because everyone would want to go to confession before Lent began. And the churches would be thronged the day or a couple days before Ash Wednesday as all the faithful wanted to get to confession before Lent began. So that brings up a good question, why? Well, a couple of reasons. One of them, to begin the season well, to be purified of sin and thus to enter into the season with the proper dispositions. But also because there is no merit to the good works we perform if we are not in the state of grace. So someone who is not in the state of grace can perform penance, prayer, good works, and this person will receive actual graces but cannot earn merit. So what is merit? Merit is our place in heaven. Merit is defined as a right to a reward. So we build up, we gain so many merits by all of the prayers we say, the sacraments we receive, the good works we perform. We build up merit in this life, which is going to be, will determine our place in heaven in the next life. But if someone performs a good work who's not in the state of grace, there's no merit. So these people thought, well, we have to fast. The church is requiring this. We don't want to fast and do all this penance and not get any merit from it. So they would go to confession the day before Lent to make certain they were in the state of grace. So that is a, at least a more Catholic uh, way of spending the last couple days before Lent. And again, no problem with having a nice meal the last day, as long as we are moderate always, and that we do penance during Lent. But I would like to come back to the idea of Shrove Tuesday and talk about confession in general, because it is one of the seven sacraments, and we want to make certain that we appreciate this sacrament. Some people will go, maybe fall into the habit of just rarely going to confession, and they'll say, well, I, I can't think of anything. I don't know what to confess. I, there's nothing serious on my conscience, so I'll just put off confession. And it is important to understand that confession serves not only as an opportunity to be purified from sin, to have our sins forgiven, but also as a strengthening sacrament. One of the effects of the sacrament of penance is for the grace to help us conquer temptation. And I would make an analogy here with health. Especially nowadays, there's a lot of understanding or realization that we shouldn't just think about our health when we get sick. Time to go to a doctor and ask for some medicine to get well. Rather, we should strive to maintain good health through proper nutrition and exercise and, and a good lifestyle, etc maintaining health, what we might call preventive medicine. And we should look upon confession in that way, not just to think of going to confession when we need it, but rather regular confession. Canon law directs priests and religious to go to confession every week. I read the life recently of St. Vincent Ferrer and it said there that he went to confession every day and he was a saint. So why did he go to confession every day? To purify himself, to help him strive for holiness, to receive those graces of the sacrament. Now in going to confession, we should remember what is necessary. And there are two things in particular. Of course, you remember the catechism talks about the five things to make a good confession. Examination of conscience, confessing our sins to the priest, contrition, purpose of amendment, and then satisfaction or doing the penance the priest gives us. But I would like to concentrate on those two elements of contrition and purpose of amendment. Why is it? Some people will say, well, I go to confession and I must admit I commit the same sins over and over. Well, why is that? Most likely because our contrition is not as deep, as heartfelt as it could be, as it should be. Think of St. Mary Magdalene. 
Here is an example of a saint who had been a great sinner, but she was so thoroughly contrite that she became a great saint. Our Lord said of her, many sins are forgiven her because she has loved much. And the epistle today was about love, charity. St. Mary Magdalene's charity was so great that it caused her to have deep and heartfelt, true contrition. So maybe if we're committing the same sins, maybe we don't have as deep, real contrition as we ought, which by meditating on the passion of our Lord, that helps us to conceive a greater hatred and sorrow for sin. But second, we must have the firm purpose of amendment. And it can't just be a flimsy, I want to avoid sin. I am determined not to offend God again. And that may be another cause why we fail to make progress, because our purpose of amendment is weak. It is not strong and determined. So concentrate on those two important aspects of confession. Now, some spiritual writers say you could, you could classify all confessions into two groups, <laughs> confessions of necessity and confessions of devotion. A confession of necessity would be where a person is in the state of mortal sin, and he needs to go to confession to have that, that sin or those sins forgiven so that he can receive Holy Communion. So that confession is necessary. Cannot go to con Holy Communion without first making a good confession. But a confession of devotion would be all the other confessions where a person goes to confession regularly and has not committed a serious sin, but is going to advance in holiness and to obtain the graces to conquer temptation and to grow spiritually. And this is a very important part of the spiritual life. Regular confession, frequent confession. I would say at the very least to go to confession at least once a month and preferably every couple weeks. Some wish to go to confession every week and that's certainly commendable. But the idea here is that it is a sacrament. One of the seven channels of grace that our Lord instituted and we can go to confession as often as we wish. Now, it may happen, if you are in the habit of going to confession frequently, that you can't think of any sins per se since your last confession. And so you will confess what we would say faults and failings. And that is why it is important to always conclude our confessions by saying, I am heartily sorry for these, what you've confessed, for these and all the sins of my past life, because that is providing matter for absolution. A priest can't give absolution if there is no matter. And the matter would be sins that are confessed for which the person is truly sorry and uh, has contrition and purpose of amendment. Any sins committed after baptism would be matter for the sacrament. So even a sin that was forgiven years ago, you could confess, or, or a classification of sins, or at least to say, I'm sorry for all the sins of my past life. We renew the sorrow, but that also provides matter for the sacrament. So let us reflect upon this wonderful Catholic custom that was observed in England of going to confession before Lent in order to dispose the person to make a good Lent, to obtain the merit, for his fasting and penance and good works, but also to look upon confession as a wonderful sacrament, the sacrament of God's mercy, a sacrament of grace, and a sacrament that we can receive as often as we wish, as long as we are properly disposed and prepare well for this wonderful sacrament that helps us overcome temptation and strengthens us in the practice of virtue. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.